All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for being here this evening. And our first order of business is, we have an airport update with Mr. Seth Cutter. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you attending our meeting. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Seth Cutter. I handle government affairs for CVG, just right across the way, um, and thank the mayor and the council for affording some time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and circulate these to those on the, the dais. This is just a little information, all available on the airport website, and I'll go through uh, some of the details that are highlighted um, in our strategic plan and our latest update uh, from uh, the first quarter of the year um, and thank the city administrator for assisting uh, with the distribution. Uh, so I'll try to be brief, but as I explained to the mayor, uh, I have trouble with this and there's lots of good things happening at the airport. So definitely uh, uh, wanted to start um, as I'm relatively new in this role coming to update um, our great municipal community partners such as the city um, on a more regular basis just to keep you apprised of what's happening, um, all the good things, even when things aren't going as great, we wanna make sure we're in conversation uh, with the council and the community. Um, so, um, recapping uh, 2018, I know we're almost, uh, almost halfway through 2019, but 2018 was certainly a record year, and I think a lot of that is thanks to the entire community, right? The whole Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky region. We uh, uh, clocked in the year at nearly 9 million passengers, um, which is incredible when you think of just a few years ago that that was only about 6 uh, million passengers, so incredible growth. Uh, with passengers, of course, we all know and we'll talk more about um, the cargo footprint at the airport. We're now North America's eighth largest cargo airport, right? So that's a great uh, selling point to, to our airport. We have um, certainly are a, uh, a regional jobs hub with over 14,000 badged employees on campus, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then all told and all together, um, the airport has a nearly four and a half billion dollar economic impact to the region, right? So that's not just the jobs on campus, that's not just um, the payroll generated in Boone County, that's across Ohio, Kentucky, and all the uh, jurisdictions therein. Uh, and I should say, council members, if you have a question, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, but this I wanted to expand a little bit more on, right, because it's very relevant for, for you all as decision makers for the community. Uh, the airport is a job hub, right? Um, so we have over 70 uh, employ different employer companies on campus, right? So that ranges everywhere from airlines, Southwest Airlines, Delta, et cetera, to all the cargo operators. Uh, such as DHL and then of course federal partners like the TSA. Um, so all told, um, those 70 plus employers employ uh, direct uh, badge holders, folks on campus, more than 14,000 and that number is climbing. So traditionally, uh, most of those folks have always come from Kentucky, right? Many here in Erlanger itself. Um, increasingly, we have a number uh, coming across the river every day from Ohio. So um, remember, as the total footprint of the number of employees increases, we find increasingly, right, those folks are coming from even north of Cincinnati down to the airport, uh, still a large number uh, from Kentucky and Erlanger. And I meant to look that number up before I came, but I will get that to you all. Um, how many come from the zip code 41? Uh, 018 and others in the city. So you know, right, and generally I think the last I checked it was several hundred at least. Um, so total, right, and this is the ancillary impact of the airport, beyond that uh, 14,000 number, over because of the airport and all the uh, surrounding economic uh, growth, that contributes over 31,000 direct and induced jobs because of the airport, and then we already went through that 4.4 billion number. This doesn't quite show what I was trying to describe, but 
uh, when we map uh, the numbers of employees that come uh, to the, that work at the airport where they reside by zip code, you see this map, um, the, what looks to be brighter green are our, um, are our largest numbers across the region. So you can definitely see that here in Kenton County and in, in the city, uh, we draw a considerable number of Erlanger residents uh, who work just down the street. Uh, so again, we'll get that number to you. Um, the strategic plan, council members, that you have in front of you is a document that uh, was, was developed in 2015 and introduced in 2016, uh, rolled out by uh, the airport board, um, really to uh, relaunch, if you will, um, our bargain, our airport bargain with the airlines, with the community, et cetera. You remember in that time, things were not going as well as they were today. And the strategic plan, the booklet, the smaller booklet that you have in front of you outlines really this vision, mission, and challenge, which was we are going to diversify uh, the, the airlines. Uh, we're going to uh, run the airport as a business. Uh, and you can see where that vision of making the travel experience unforgettably positive, where we're becoming the airport of choice to work with, do business with, and fly from, um, where you see that that intentional strategy and, and everything in that document uh, that has guided us to this point has really had an impact, right? Diversifying airlines so we're not just a single uh, carrier hub airport. Uh, we have uh, that uh, strategy really to thank for helping drive the average airfares down. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so you can see, and, and all those uh, folks with us can see as well, these are really our five success metrics, uh, just as the city has a number of success metrics. Uh, these are the big five for us by 2021, uh, which is uh, 9.4 million passengers, leasing um, uh, 350 acres of airport land for commercial and industrial use or office use, uh, increasing our economic impact to $5 billion, uh, demolishing, which we have done, our obsolete facilities, so that was Concourse C, folks will remember Comair flew out of that facility, uh, and then Terminals 1 and 2, and then of course building our new consolidated rental car facility right adjacent to the terminal, and increasing our airport service quality rankings, that's what ASQ stands for. So very ambitious and a five-year plan, um, but this uh, map, uh, which I know is hard to see, but you get the idea, it's the US. Um, but this is our spider map which really hits to that 9.4, right? And, and what you see here, what, what we really talk about when we, be, when we say we've been intentional about diversifying the carriers at CVG, uh, not 10 or 15 years ago, this map was one color because the colors represent the number of carriers serving a specific city or route. It would have all been blue, which legacy is not only Delta, but American and United. Um, but this map was not as many colors it is, as it is today. So the tan or lighter color there, the low cost carriers are folks like Southwest, Allegiant, Frontier. Uh, and then the green represents um, a route that is served by both a legacy carrier and a low cost carrier. So you can see now that we're up to nearly 160, 170 peak days, so the, the busiest day departures to over 50 nonstop destinations where most of our travelers, right, coming through in and out of the front door of the airport are indeed our local community. It's 90% now of, of all those nine, nearly 9 million passengers are from, live in, do business in uh, here in Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati where you remember during the Delta days, that number was the complete opposite. We were maybe 10% and then everybody else maybe went to other unnamed airports. Um, but we're, we're so happy that everybody has embraced this new business model for the airport and is returning um, to CVG. So that's represented in these statistics where O and D uh, means origination and destination, so that merely means local. So our local passengers have increased in the last three years by nearly 60% at the same time that um, the average airfares have decreased in that time nearly a third, right? So 
you can see that trend, as I was describing, even where the numbers got down in the uh, not too distant past, down to the five millions, back up and climbing, incredible growth. Um, and the, so that this one, this slide shows the overall passengers, and then this uh, slide here shows you that local passenger growth. So again, um, good news all around. But what I want to share with you um, after I get through this slide, um, which describes in detail this idea of the average airfare, right? So we used to be number one on a, on a list that nobody wanted to be number one on, the most expensive to fly from. Um, we're now 83rd or in the high 70s and low 80s out of the top 100 airports in the country, right? And that's the lowest of all our competitors in the region, Columbus, Indianapolis, Dayton, Louisville, et cetera. So on average, right, this is not universally true, but on average, folks are paying, uh, compared to four years ago, in excess of $200 less uh, in airfare than they did, right? So that is, is a great testament to this business strategy, but also to the community for embracing that. Um, this is what I wanted to share with you. I was so excited because I think it's very relevant uh, to where we're headed, of course, is our cargo growth. So we'll talk about Amazon in a minute, but overall, right, DHL already runs its North American uh, global super hub out of CVG. Uh, many of your friends and neighbors, you know folks that work there, come in and out every day. Um, compared to three, three and a half years ago, they're handling 50% more annual cargo tonnage um, and just 20% um, growth in uh, 2018 over 2017, so just incredible. And you can see here in this slide uh, where that has trended. It's just been exponential. And a lot of it is thanks to Amazon and DHL growing as well. So I think, yes, just last week I threw this slide in here because we did uh, do the ceremonial groundbreaking uh, with Amazon um, at, at the airport. Um, one of the things that I think is very important for you all to know, right, Amazon is already operating out of CVG in partnership with DHL. So they have about 18 aircraft that are based on the DHL ramp. What they're building, so you, you've, if you've been uh, uh, down Donaldson, Aero Parkway, you see the activity there. Um, what that represents is really a dedicated facility for Amazon, that is their air hub. And they will create ramp, so the concrete pads of parking, just as DHL has for their operation to be dedicated out of, right? So that project will be phased in over a number of years. And I think importantly, right, for you as community leaders and for the community as well, um, certainly we appreciate everyone's patience. We are working diligently with KYTC, with Boone County, Kenton County, City of Florence, OKI, um, on the impacts of that project, right? I think as, as much as we talk about the jobs are great, um, over 2,000 new jobs eventually in the first next few years because of this project, we know that folks are concerned about truck movements um, because this is already such a busy corridor. Folks are worried about congestion um, and, and various other things. Um, so know that those considerations are very high on our list. Um, as Amazon builds that site out. Um, and uh, we know that uh, and are working toward a number of improvements uh, to Donaldson Mineola Corridor, to Arrow Parkway. Um, nearly every intersection of uh, the surrounding interstates, right, or interchange rather, of I 275, uh, the 7175 corridor, will maybe not immediately, but will eventually be looked at, right? Because the other piece of this, and I think this is a tribute uh, to the leadership here in the city, the, the surrounding area and the economic impact and growth that is happening is all contributing to what I think we all agree are headaches and are part of the growth. Um, but when you take all these things together, right, the Coca-Cola project, Amazon's project, everything else, it all kind of hits at the same pain points, if you will. So that's where OKI, KYTC, others are looking at all these things holistically um, and where we're obviously feeding them data and information as well. So it is, above all else, it is very exciting. We expect a lot of growth 
hopefully projects here in the city as well because of Amazon's uh, air hub here at CVG. Um, and then I'll close because I've gone way over time. I'm glad the mayor hasn't cut me off, so it must be somewhat interesting. Um, but uh, this, this we're probably most pleased about, uh, the airport staff. Um, Skytrax is a global ranking of all world airports and, and consistently uh, we're always um, ranked very highly. This is not to toot our own horn, but I think more as a testament to the community uh, that these rankings are derived from passenger surveys and I think that's a great testament to all of our community because it's our constituents, our community members that are employees that are delivering top quality customer service and that are landing us very high on these lists. Um, so as Candace McGraw, our CEO, likes to say, fly early and fly often, especially this summer. It is going to be a busy summer, so um, there are lots of travel deals out there. Encourage your uh, families and friends to uh, be great users of the airport and, of course, uh, to the council or anyone in the community. I've included my contact information. If folks have questions, concerns, um, email, phone, uh, please contact me uh, or others you may know at the airport anytime. We're glad um, to try to address issues or, or talk to others about the good things that are happening. So I'll be glad to take questions or shut up so you can get on with your evening. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Wasn't there an article in the paper within the last couple of days about Ms. McGraw? Yes, so that was last Friday. Uh, you know, she's been our CEO for nearly eight years now. Uh, she came to us from the Cleveland airport. Um, and it is really, I think that article and other press you may have seen recently is really a testament to um, her philosophy about running the airport as a business. Um, you know, not a, a, an opportunity would go by where she doesn't recognize our great business partners, our great airport employees, and, it, and it, it's always a team effort, but uh, I think her leadership and the leadership of our board uh, and executive staff have really charted, as you see in front of you with the strategic plan, have charted a course uh, for where we are today and where we're headed. So thank you. Thank you. Seth, I did yes, want to sir. say one thing. Um, in November of last year, mm -hmm. I got an email from one of our citizens about airplane noise that they hadn't heard before, and they were just curious about it. Um, so we had, I had sent it to some people at CVG, and very, to me, it's very surprising since you were talking about customer service. Mm -hmm. We got a very good email back from okay. one of your analysts, um, sent to her, CC'd mm -hmm. me, um, and a couple other people, and, and really thoroughly explained why that occurs at certain times. She even put a map of the flight plans, the right. primary ones, the alternate. And to me, that was just a huge ordeal. And you know, she asked me for that, and I figured there's no way CVG is going to take the time to really oh, explain no. that for one citizen, you know, out off Richardson. Um, but it was really nice to to get that within a couple of days of her inquiry. So I just it kind of goes along with the customer service that I've seen out there. It's pretty pretty impressive. Well, thank you, sir. And I will. Be sure to relay the, uh, the note. Uh, what I would suggest to folks, though, we've spent some time because we know noise is very subjective, right? What bothers, it's like living next to a highway or a railway. What bothers one person may not bother another. Um, so in keeping, right, with this idea of good customer service, good being a good neighbor, um, we know that at least there's a perception that with Amazon and with growth comes more. Um, it's not necessarily more like it was in the Delta hub days, uh, but Hannah, who you're uh, re referring to, leads a great operation uh, with our aviation noise kind of office, and she's built out a number of pages on the website. So if folks uh, contact you all, uh, the city, uh, if you have friends and neighbors who are like, I've never, I, something woke me in the middle of the night, what was that? If you go to cbgairport.com, there it is, um, search for noise. Uh, we're still building these pages out, but a number of maps, other resources about how does it work in a normal uh, f day of flying, how does it work if it's bad wind or weather. She has a number of great maps there that folks can learn more. And then there's also a tool where it's near real time 
track, flight tracking essentially, uh, where there's a three day look back as well. So if folks uh, go on there and create an account, you can, you'll have the tools to say something woke me up last night, what was it? And find out exactly what it was. And then of course, our team is always glad to, uh, to talk to folks. So thank you. <coughs> I had a quick question, Mr. Cutter. Yes, is sir. There a, is there a Reader's Digest version explanation of how you got your airfares down so low? So we could probably, I think we may have like a deck around that, um, but I think the, the verbal Reader's Digest, as it were, is very much so Del Delta is our former hub carrier, which I should note, is still our largest carrier. Delta is doing extremely well. We are still classified as a focus city in their network. Um, so it's not a hub as it once was, but it's still a large footprint. Um, and they're a great business partner, but they had a very long-term lease, think in excess of 40-year uh, lease agreement with the airport um, that dictated who could do what, et cetera, right? Um, it governed their operation and our relationship with them. The reason you see the strategic plan in front of you dated 2015, 2016 is that was the year that that agreement came to an end. So this idea of um, some of the strategies Candace has been lauded for, I think are also a testament to renegotiating a use and lease agreement with all carriers or in a more favorable way for all business partners to come into the airport, uh, right, and to uh, keep costs low, right, keep landing fees, keep gate rental fees on the airport side low, so that we're attractive for a mix of carriers to come in. Uh, Allegiant being one of the first that came in in about 2012, 2013, <coughs> Frontier followed quickly thereafter. Um, then in 20. 15 and thereafter, you started seeing everybody start to grow, right? Jet fuel prices uh, have been very good, which dictates a lot of business decisions for the airlines. Uh, but also you see United growing, American growing. As you keep costs low and be, keep a level playing field for all these business partners, you start to see folks adding routes, uh, flights during the day, capacity on their aircraft, upgaging aircraft, and all of that has equaled this growth and a drop in um, airfares. Um, so that's really, I think, where you can see a true running the airport as a business as a testament to Business 101. So hopefully that Excellent. takes it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Sir? So the answer to your question is not at this time. Um, the, we have about 7,700 acres on the campus. So the campus is quite large, uh, and we are still pursuing this land development strategy. I mentioned the 350 acres of land lease, the Wayfair building on Donaldson you've seen. We've started developing properties that we already own. So as, as far as I'm aware, at this time, we don't have an intention for turf wipe. Yes, sir. In in turn, well, so I'll answer it this way. It's a great question. Certainly, a lot of folks related to this idea of noise are worried about that sort of thing. Um, Amazon has not yet shared their schedule, um, nor will they have to until they become operational in that building. Um, currently, I can, I can tell you that of the eight, 18 aircraft that are based out of CBG, you know, they're, they're working in partnership with DHL, so DHL primarily runs an overnight sort and pushes out in the morning. Um, Amazon uh, starts a day shift and pushes out in the afternoon. Obviously, those are both 24-7 operations. In terms of the total number of aircraft, um, they are, 
in their environmental permitting and other regulatory plans, they've submitted that eventually uh, they would get to in excess of 70 aircraft based out of CVG. Um, again, that's not all at once. That's not all in 2021 when the facility first becomes operational. Um, but in terms of times of day, um, we don't yet know. We would only assume that what they're currently doing will continue um, and then we'll find out more as they get going. Um, to assuage though some fears about noise, something that folks should know is anytime any airport has a considerable change in traffic, whether it be total aircraft operations or this hub for instance, one generally about a year after they um, the new operation begins the FAA requires us to do another kind of study of those day night uh, sound levels of the operational impacts to the community and so that is kind of on the radar for early to mid 2020 the 2020s sir would, would you mind if you would you mind sharing your name for the record or would you mind sharing your name yeah, yeah. <laughs> would you mind coming up to the mic? Because I mean, I know we can hear you, but I know as far as like the the recordings and stuff of the room, nobody else will be able to hear. Here you go. That's okay. How, How are you, sir? I'm Tim Quill. It's great Hi, to Tim. meet you. Glad welcome, to, welcome good, to the mic. Presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see. The only uh, question I have remaining is the type of aircraft that'll be flying from Amazon, because. Typically, my experience has been that the cargo planes are probably some of the oldest planes and the noisiest planes out there. So hopefully that's not a problem because that, of course, when you talk of going from 18 to 80 aircraft. 70. Yeah. <laughs> Kazoon height. Yeah. Whatever. But that's the only question I have no, remaining. That's a great question, and I think it's on the minds of a lot of folks. Um, so here's the important thing to know. Generally, so Amazon and DHL and the folks that fly for them uh, are generally flying Boeing 767s, 777s, they even have added smaller 37s in the mix. They are larger, wider body aircraft for what they've got inside versus a regional jet that Comair used to fly. Right. However, uh, while they are heavier, right, um, because landed weights you saw have increased, um, it doesn't necessarily, not always, but necessarily mean they're louder. So even though uh, the aircraft and the components thereof, so it, especially the engines, have to go through obviously maintenance cycles, but also replacement cycles. And the key thing with noise is not so much the weight or the size of the aircraft, but is the engine and the thrust it takes to move it. Sure. So can, uh, importantly, engine technology over the last 30 years really has greatly improved it will continue to do so so our hope is as you know amazon either retrofits passenger airline or passenger aircraft for their operation dhl eventually will have to cycle through on their aircraft these aircraft while the number of aircraft coming in increases the hope is that the actual sound production output decreases won't always be true but that's that's the way we're headed. Who controls that? Is that controlled by that's the company, a, the FAA, or the airport? So that's a great question. The FAA regulates, uh, the FAA certifies, as everybody's kind of seen with this Boeing 737 MAX situation, the FAA certifies every aircraft. Um, they dictate, uh, you know, how many cycles an aircraft has to have before something gets replaced or repaired. Um, and and so that's more on the aircraft side, on um, like flight patterns. That's also the, the the guys and gals at the tower, right here down the down the road. So a lot of it is FAA. But what we always say is, that's kind of the role of the airport as well. Whether it be flight patterns, et cetera, is working with the community to figure out, you know, are there particularly noise sensitive areas, or is there a new problem that the tower is not aware of, et cetera. So. Okay. Thanks, Seth. Thank Appreciate you, sir. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I know you said you just started. You're doing a hell of a job. Well, thanks. <laughs> it's been a year and a half. I'll count that as new. But they give me a lot of gray hairs, so. 
<laughs> Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Mayor. You Thank you job. all. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the Heritage Day update, and I have a little presentation for you guys. I'll try to be as brief as possible. You can see you all. It's kind of hard to see everybody up there. Okay. So I have a couple of people in the room that are in the Heritage Day task force with me. So if you guys hear something that's inaccurate or I'm missing something, let me know. I tried to make this brief. Um, all right, so our team, you can see that on the board. We tried to include almost every, every department within the city, make sure that we had a really good representation of all the players we would need to have something um, of a grand um, caliber happen. Um, so we have Kevin Quinn from Public Works, we have three representatives from City Council, we have uh, Pat Hahn from the Erlanger Historical Society, Kim Wolking, our event planner, Stephanie Stubblefield is a citizen within the city. She lives on um, Forest Avenue and Sherry, which you you are just fantastic uh, explaining what has gone on at previous Heritage Days and trying to bring those really cool events that were unique to, to current day. So thank you. Um, and then Joe Christafeld is, um, you know, our marketing and our PR, making sure that we're properly marketing this um, for the future. Um, so the original intent of this is to have a grand event. So we all love Heritage Day. Um, but there have been over the, uh, over the past few years um, a couple of things that could be, be done better. Um, I've heard some issues with the vendors, some of the food vendors pulling out because there weren't enough people to make up the cost of them actually setting up during, um, during the time on Sunday. Um, so just a couple of different challenges that we wanted to, ta to tackle um, and try to make it pay for itself, basically. Um, so the goal is to establish business sponsorships, so sponsorship levels where our business community can contribute um, and actually have the, the event completely paid for um, by the business community. Um, we want to enhance, you know, of course, enhance this great event that's been happening for a number of years, implementing new ideas um, and solutions, adding a musical performance, having new food and drink ideas, so food trucks. Um, I, I don't know if any of you attended the Art in the Park, but the Braxton truck, that was a huge hit. Um, having art and craft vendors um, and a new location to accommodate a larger event so and additional parking options as well. Um, our goal is to increase attendance and support a broader age range for the Erlanger population. Um, so as you all have heard, um, 2019 we had decided to put, put Heritage Day on hold. Um, we never canceled it, it was never our intention to cancel it, um, hence why we have this beautiful task force. Um, so this year, what we're going to plan on doing um, is put the Heritage Day reboot on pause and really make sure that we're properly planning for 2020, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, but understanding that the citizens love having a community event in that particular weekend in September, um, what we've decided to do is we were having a second Art in the Park event in October. Um, we've decided to move it up to that weekend. Um, so we're still going to be able to provide, um, you know, family fun, free family fun for our community. Um, we'll have a, um, a musical performance. We'll have food trucks, um, art and craft vendors. Um, so similar, but not on the huge grand scale of the 2020 event, um, but still having something. Um, the second Art in the Park will be held on September 21st. We moved it from a Saturday to a Sunday. So it'll be throughout the day from 11 to 2. Um, and it'll still be held in Misty Creek Park. 
Um, so the previous Art in the Park was held at Spring Valley Park. Um, and it was always the intention for Art in the Park to try and um, engage a whole different community. Um, so we had never had a, a community event at Spring Valley. And we, you know, we wanted to have something for their, their citizens that they could walk from their house to. Um, same same uh, thought process went into choosing Misty Creek Park. Um, we've, yet, we've yet to have a city event there. Um, so trying to activate that community. Um, so that leads us to the 2020 plan. Um, there's gonna be a lot more information coming out and just today we um, had a Heritage Day Task Force meeting um, where we officially changed the name of the task force and we also broke into subcommittees so that we can start tackling some of these, these particular tasks that need to be done. So sponsorship levels, logistics and facilities, um, the main stage that we're gonna have, so the bands, the different events that are going to go on, um, the marketing and media, food and drink vendors, art and craft vendors, and the family entertainment. Um, so our, our plan is September 19th, 2020 is the planned date um, we're planning from 2 p.m. to set to 10 p.m. Um, so it, really what we're looking for is an all day, you know, you come and hang out and we're gonna have a good time. Um, good time for the whole family. Um, the new name for the event um, is the Erlanger Summer Sendoff at Silver Lake. Um, so we are wanting to move the, the event to Silver Lake Park it can accommodate a much bigger event um, and break, break it into sections. Um, and I, I can show you guys off the, you know, offline, I don't have the uh, image of what we're planning, but I have one. Um, the budget will be approximately $25,000. Um, again, subcommittees have been formulated. We've been working with a company called Cincinnati Circus, who Kim Wolking um, works with a lot. Um, they are um, a phenomenal resource. Um, they are, we just signed a contract um, to hold the date of September 19th, because they book up so fast. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we reserved them for that date. They're gonna take care of setting up a stage, the PA system, DJ. It also includes a 60 by 40 tent that seats 300 people with tables and chairs. Um, and then there's all kinds of other events that they have, they offer. Um, we'll get into those in just a second. Um, the grand plan, if money allows, is a fireworks show to close down, which Mr. Tom Kale is our pyrotechnic. So we're gonna be calling on his skill set. All right, so kids area, like I said, we want it, this to be um, really fun for all ages. Um, so the, a couple of the things that we're thinking about in the kids area, um, six inflatables with attendance. So the Cincinnati Circus, if you contract with them, they, they provide the people to, um, to tend you know, the kids getting in, them getting out, how long they're supposed to stay in there, the safety, they take care of all of that. They set up everything, they tear everything down, clean everything up. Um, they also have atmosphere entertainment, which Kim has used before, stilt walkers, uh, balloon artists, magician, face painter, juggler. Um, some other options that we're considering is a rock wall and a zip line. So something that would be very different than you've seen in any other city. Um, something that would make us stand out. Um, and then we're definitely, um, this is probably one of the more fun things we've been talking about is a dunking booth. So having um, local politicians and local ce celebrities. Uh, <laughs> that might be enough to pay for the whole event. <laughs> um, so we're looking forward to that one. It should be fun. Um, so adult entertainment ideas, um, Cincinnati Circus offers a, um, a circus thrill show, which it, the guy explained it as 30 minutes of jaw-dropping, um, just constant entertainment. And it's the entire event, every 30 minutes this show runs. And you know, it's, 
aerial acrobatics, wheel of destiny, which I don't even know what that means, but it sounds amazing. Um, so that's gonna be not only for adults. I mean, the kids are gonna enjoy that as well. Um, we're hoping to at least have two live bands. Um, so if you guys are out during this summer and this fall and you're listening to bands in Crestview Hills and Fort Mitchell and you hear somebody that you like, send them my way or go up and ask them if they're free. Um, something that Sherry brought up was a pie eating contest. So, <laughs> so um, you know, this is something that we're going to go to Colonial Cottage and see if they would want to sponsor a pie, pie eating contest um, and kind of, you know, bring that really cool event back. Um, we're also going to have a vendor grove, so art and craft vendors, same as Heritage Day. Um, one of the options is also having a pet show. So how many people love their pets? Um, and I think if we talk to David Clegg from Allie's Walkabout to sponsor some kind of pet show, he'd be all about it. Um, having a small Erlanger's Got Talent is also an option. Um, so different, <laughs> I know, we're, no staff allowed. <laughs> we have fun here in the city of Erlanger. Um, having a beer garden, bourbon trail. Um, so a couple of different adult entertainment ideas. Um, food and vendor ideas, um, multiple food trucks, Dreamy Whip for ice cream. Um, anybody that was at the, the um, Art in the Park, Dreamy Whip was amazing. Um, just soft serve ice cream with all kinds of wonderful toppings. So Braxton Brewery um, and uh, Kevin Quinn is going to work out how many food trucks we can actually accommodate on the space so before we start inviting people. That is it. Um, I can answer any questions, and if I forgot anything that was really exciting and wonderful, Sherry, help me out. For the date for 2019, you said we remove it from a Saturday to Sunday. It's actually on Saturday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. You just had it backwards. That's okay. Yeah. Flip, flip that. Sorry. We're moving it from a Sunday to a Saturday. Because who wants to stay out till 10 p.m. on a Sunday night? All right. Any other questions? Rain? No rain date. And that scares the heck out of... Kim, but um, the Cincinnati Circus, they, I don't know how they do it, but they don't have rain dates, and he's like, we don't let it bother us. We keep moving forward. And with the 60 by 40 tent, um, so there will be, the, the band will be over, they will have a, a shelter over top of them. And then we're also thinking about the additional tenting for the art and craft vendors. So having, having something set up for everybody where in the event there is rain, you know, there's a lot that are, that's protected. Um, are you gonna have busing there? We are, we have. Um, Cause there is hardly any parking. Yeah, there. so we are working on that. That's one of our subcommittees. Kevin Quinn is gonna be talking to the local businesses that are around there um, and making sure that we can um, accommodate the parking okay. so that was def that's definitely something that is on the forefront of our mind and my only other concern that I would have I think it sounds fabulous by the way I'm not trying to put you down about okay. it with any of it um, but how are the elderly people going to get down that hill get down the hill to Silver Lake mm. no stairs okay there's, there's great Stop, level. drop, and I'm, roll. I'm sure in, in, the t in the time between now and then, we'll be able to arrange a sponsorship opportunity for someone to uh, ha provide um, people who need assistance okay. some sort of transportation. Yeah, but I'm sure somebody will jump on that opportunity. Well, I, you know, and, I, and we'll be for them if they do that, but I'm just saying, if you've got rain and mm -hmm. you've got elderly citizens trying, and that's a steep hill to get down there. 
So there's, I don't there's know. There's parking on the on the west well, yeah, side of the, the park. Well, yeah, by the basketball hoops. Yeah, over by the there's there's a there's a pretty large parking lot on the west side of Silver Lake, and that's all pretty well grade level. You know, from that point. That's into, that to, to that where the only holds go. about ten cars. Uh, I think it's more um, than that. I think we I had think calculated about. I think it's 92. about twenty-one there. There's ninety. There's over ninety parking spots. When you take into consideration parking all spots right around Silver Lake. It's it's surprising. Like I wouldn't have thought it was that many, and then when we started putting together all the different parking lots that are around there, mm -hmm. it added up to 92 spots. It was it was pretty surprising because uh, I had the same concern. Um, but if you come from um, if you if come you, from where the basketball hoops are, you can walk around the tennis courts and then it look links right. up to the walk right path. that's the way i go to my son's soccer game because i yeah. can't go down that hill yeah yeah i mean you just it's it's impassable almost yeah. so okay. we, we could also maybe look at designating all of the spots to handicap oh, yeah. only yeah what? <laughs> oh I'll beat you to it <laughs> oh you 27 20. spots that's a okay but that's a really good idea Putting them as handicap spots. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. If you guys have questions, feel free to let me know. I have a small business incentive ordinance update, so I'll make this super fast so that we can uh, skedaddle. Um, the small business uh, task force has been working on a grant opportunity. Um, and Mayor Fetty allocated um, $50,000 for the 2019-2020 budget to use toward um, an incentive of some sort for our businesses in the community. So um, we've got on our task force myself, uh, Mr. Hermes, Mr. Hahn, uh, Ms. Fetty, and then three community partners, um, resident, or not re one resident and two, two residents and um, one business, or two business owners. I don't know how it breaks down. Three community partners is what I'll call them. <laughs> um, and we've come up with a grant opportunity, which the first reading will be on the 4th of June. Um, and it's gonna be consist of 10 grants for $5,000 that um, legacy businesses, which we've defined as any business in Erlanger that's been here for more than 10 years, uh, will have the opportunity to, um, to apply for a grant um, to improve Aesthetics and structural improvements, um, anything from facade improvements to painting, paving, installations of awnings, new doors, windows, those are just examples of, um, of the aesthetic changes that can be done. Um, and it's a matching program, so um, we would provide up to $5,000 if they invest up to $5,000 on their end. So if they invest $2,000, then we would match it with $2,000. Um, but it's up to $5,000, and then they would be eligible every five years to reapply. Um, we want to have the application process available on July 1st, because that's the beginning of the new fiscal year, um, so that we can, we can start getting applications and, and do what we can to, to uh, incentivize our businesses here in Erlinger. Do you guys have any questions, at least between now and or before we go live with yeah, I've got a question. Oh, of course you do. <laughs> What's up? I thought I was going to be quiet, but um, so we're, I, I, has the criteria and the selection, so if we get, you know, 50 applicants, I don't know that there's 50 businesses, mm -hmm. but how are we determining who does what? It's going to be on a first come, first, first, come first serve. Okay. But, and it's got to meet the, the various stipulations, and there's, the granular detail will be available in the ordinance than when we present it on the 4th for the first reading. Um, of, of all of the criteria. The okay. payroll has to be under $750,000 because there are other programs available for businesses above that and so on. So, but that's kind of, that's what we've come up with thus far and we're super excited. Yes. So just uh, the question then, so you set the criteria, so are they gonna have to present plans or anything ahead of time? Yes, so it will be a reimbursement type okay. um, grant. Okay. And I, and I guess I'm assuming we're planning a special meeting as well to get this in before July. Jack? We didn't contemplate that. I mean, we certainly could do, if we're gonna have a July committee meeting, we could do a special meeting. 
I think it's okay to take applications July 1st. Realistically, our second reading okay. is going to be what, July, July 5th or July 2nd? Okay. So I think from a practical matter, we can probably. All right. I was just wondering. We'll have one day of people applying before we do a second <laughs> reading. Applying for a program doesn't exist yet. I got it. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Hmm. Okay. Re really quick before we adjourn, I just want to remind everybody that May 23rd, which is this Thursday, is Government Day at the Erlanger Business Council. Um, so we will be meeting at 8.30 a.m. Uh, to 9.30, so if if all of you can try to make it there, that'd be awesome. Um, and any department heads, or if you want to send anybody in your place, um, I'd greatly appreciate your, your um, attendance. And then um, I sent out an email for the June 23rd, the Northern Kentucky Baptist Church, the God and Country. <coughs> that was like the coolest <laughs> event. Um, and I know it was really nice. It was really nice for us to be there together last year. Um, and I'd really like to do that again. So, okay, good. Very good. Um, so I think it was in your mailboxes maybe a couple weeks ago. So make sure you RSVP if you can make it. Any other questions for me? All right. Have a good night. <laughs>